Ashburn. I'm good saying this in all truth. It's good of you to take time from your duties in the Multicultural Student Support Center to enable our talk for the Generativity Committee of the American Council of Personnel Association. No problem, Dr. Hardy. Today I have a very flexible schedule. Flexible, with five telephones ringing, and your desk awash with mail, and students crowding the reception area? That could be where we begin. What about your interest in an interaction with students? How did it all begin? There are probably two answers to that. First, the influence of the home, and second, the influence, let's say, of uh, programmatic things in college. If you reflect upon Thornton Wilder's Our Town and Sinclair Lewis Main Street, you'll understand the first 16 years of my growing up. Our family home still stands in Clarion, Iowa. I was there just three weeks ago. It's 40 steps from the courthouse and about the same distance from the post office and the uh, crowded ways of life cross exactly there. Your family then was among the early settlers. Yes, my father's family migrated from East Prussia. My grandfather and father located their tailor shop right in the center of Main Street. My mother, who was of English and uh, German descent, operated a typewriter agency in our home. And it was the center of activity for this small town. The elder, the younger, the employed, the unemployed, the conservative, the liberals congregated there. The four of us kids thought that Federal Highway Number 10 ran through our house. Mm -hmm. The people came for various reasons, each for something, to be advised, to be counseled, to be encouraged, to be rebuked, any of this. All in all, my parents thought a great deal about the town and the people in it. So, when you speak of the home influence, you're also talking about community influence. Oh, indeed. Imagine a multicultural <coughs> county seat town. Let me describe some of the personalities. There were the Hispanics who came to work in the beet fields, and my father taught himself Spanish so that he could converse with them. My mother practiced her French talking to an elderly lady who was a war bride, that's World War I, who raised garden products and peddled them from home to home. Our best friends down the block were emigres from Russia and our highest, chiefest competitors for grades in high school. Two young men came from Greece to operate the main restaurant. Our schoolmates were Nordics. They answered to Danish, Norwegian, Swedish, and German surnames. They, their fathers came to, uh, let's say, grab the good and productive land, farmland in North Iowa. One of the town's five barbers, black, Moses Lester, joined up with the northern troops and fought on that side during the Civil War. And our chief of police, believe it or not, a diminutive but very feisty Irishman, came from County Cork in Ireland. Mm -hmm. Our town was a crucible, a kind of vessel for melting and calcinating uh, at high heat. And believe me, our town had that. But you said there were also some programmatic influences after you left home for, for college, some 85 miles distant. Yes, I was the first of this foreign family's grandchildren to make it to college. Seven cohorts followed later. I enrolled at the Iowa State Teachers College, the only teacher training institute in that state. And as a result, because of our singularity on that score, many of our faculty came from Columbia University in New York, and one of them was the Dean of Women, Sadie B. Campbell. She made all kinds of leadership opportunities for women in our college through scholarships, through mortar board, through student government. And uh, for this, she knew what she was doing because the graduates would be going back into small rural towns where leadership was needed or small industrial towns on the coast there uh, along the coast, meaning the Mississippi River. She was memorialized mm -hmm. in terms of what she did. So this was an era of outstanding dean of men and dean of women. Oh, it was indeed. 
there were, they were administrators with great power. Dean Campbell, early on, offered a course, and she titled it Student Personnel Work, open to upper class women only. As a sophomore, I petitioned and was allowed to enter this class that had st such strange nomenclature. And about the same time, a young Columbia University graduate joined her as director of the Teachers College Commons. That name parallels something like the, um, I would say, the student union here. Miss Edith McCullum of Jacksonville, Florida, came to rural North Iowa. And therein after, our lives, the two of our lives, crossed three times and the third time on this campus. And I'm guessing that McCollum Hall on Florida State University's campus is named for her. Exactly that. She was the director of residence here, FSU, during the time that there was the integration of men. The prestigious Florida State University was prestigious the State College for Women, and this occurred in 1948, this change. And your arrival right here was the same year, right? Yes, it was. A consultant by the name of Dr. E.G. Williamson from the University of Minnesota recommended to the administration that there be named a coordinator of all university counseling and advisement. And I stayed in this position for approximately 12 years. I remember your description of this experiment it was described in the Faculty and College right. Counseling uh, McGraw-Hill book in 1959. You have a long-running memory, Dr. Mashburn. The idea of it was to operationalize coordination, which is a theory of administration. Mm -hmm. Your major in our state teacher's college was education with a specialty in secondary education, right? Yes, and I'll have to admit that the specialty was music education. The program in that day, and very likely in this day too, required, in addition to the basic tuition, three private lessons. And for me, that was piano, voice, and violin. One year after I began the program, my father, in checking the diminishing exchequer, gave his counsel. And this is what he said, you'll have to take something cheaper. My father, an opera buff himself, predicted that music could just as well become recreational and not professional in my case. So then you had to select a substitute major. Oh, indeed. And that was a package of sorts. I put together English, particularly creative writing, and um, speech, drama, together with journalism, and finally, business. It was a double major and a double minor and I needed to complete it in two and a half years, which was inclusive of summer sessions. I had the great hope that out in the great state of Iowa, there would be one job that would make use of a couple of these combinations. Well, did you really find a teaching post oh, in 1934? Indeed I did. And it was at the munificent salary of $80 a month running for, for nine months. And what about your coursework preparation in psychology? Probably the biggest boost in terms of my wish to become a teacher occurred when I was a sophomore in the class of Professor Finkenbinder, that would have been Ed Psych 101, who asked me, a sophomore in that class, if I would teach for two class sessions to my own class while he attended a conference. And I remember writing furiously two lesson plans and a third one, just in case one of the other ones didn't pan out. I still do that in my graduate teaching today. But to answer your question further, more psychology came about at my master's degree level in Columbia University when I was a speech correction major. More after that at the University of Chicago as a doctorate when I was in uh, reading remediation and it was after the master's degree, before the doctorate, that I made the break in teaching and went to Stevens College in Missouri to teach communicative arts. Let us now then reflect upon the master's degree in speech correction, I believe, at Columbia University. You're right. Well, it was a never to be forgotten recollection. I had the assistance of a Roberts Fellowship, 
which required that I come back to Iowa to teach for two years after finishing the master's degree. Those years, 1936 and 37, are indelible in my mind. There were the street scenes in New York City of the direst of poverty, the homeless, the destitute, and the homeless, hopeless, homeless. In my class were friends who had formerly been teachers or in the arts as performers, and I had the feeling, gathering from their desperation and their feeling of hopelessness, that maybe these things would never recover even though the federal government was putting some money to it in the form of WPA. So I convinced myself that I could do equivalent study, a minor that nobody would agree to, really, and that was no credit, but that I would work up a minor in theater by going to the theater. So I saw there in New York in those years as many plays as I possibly could Sitting in the balcony, I could see back as well as forward and learning playmanship um, from everything but the writing of it on up. And for a dollar of less or less, I saw Burgess Meredith and Catherine Cornell and Leslie Howard and Helen Hayes. She was on our campus once, you may remember, some time back as one of our commencement speakers. Some would accuse you of attempting to escape from reality by the emphasis on the theater. Well, that's a mean one, Richard. It was really introduction to reality. The theater is a reflection of life. It's a study in character. Sometimes it's overdrawn, but usually it's in truth. And it has given me perspective for the life I see lived on the campus. And then how do you explain that to uh, operationalize theater in the classroom as you do? I'll give you three illustrations, just as. I'll begin that way. Just like in 1962, the University of Mississippi's confrontation, I had taught at the University of Mississippi, and I could see, though I was here reading the newspapers and hearing from friends there, I could see the happenings. Just like South Carolina State University, and that was the Orangeburg Massacre, as labeled by Nelson and Bass in their book. I had consulted on that campus, and I had two students on the staff. And just like Kent State and Jackson State, where things came to an unsteady halt. At any rate, in my classes during those times, the class was the American College student, which I had uh, activated, it didn't exist. I taught a unit in campus rebellion for each of those campus circumstances that I've enumerated. Our repertoire, well, it was made up of video and film and guest speakers who had consulted on or were uh, critics of those campuses. There were telephone hookups where my class could hear the front end as well as the back end, you see, of the two-way speech. And there was, of course, stacks, a stack of growing stacks, with photographs which gave dimension to the scenes, the actors, the principal actors, the mobs, and then the denouement, the tragedy of some campuses, the peaceful, as in the case of this one. Twenty years ago, we managed to, in those classes, illuminate the American college student, dissonant or nonconformist, in close-ups that surpassed a single book reading. So, New York City in 1937, what else do you remember? Beside the theater? Well, there were a few other things. I learned about a publication of the year, 1937, that gave an under, uh, let's say, an under cushion base for what I learned in 1933 from Dean Sadie B. Campbell's class. I learned that there was a scholarly philosophy to student affairs and that there were 23 directives that said student affairs does this, does this, does that. The publication was titled, titled SPPOV, which stood for Student Personnel Point of View. It was authored by 18 who served on a commission, particularly selected and by a small subsidy from the American College 
um, let's say, the American Council on Education, numbers of colleges involved. The publication price, believe it or not, was 10 cents. And I'm reminded of the hit song of that time, Brother, Can You Spare a Dime? For one dime, the professionals, whoever they were in those days, received their marching orders in the clearest of rhetoric in that little book. I remember in our American College student class that you pointed out those two tasks appearing in the philosophy, addressed as they were at that time to colleges and universities as a whole. Are they still recognized today? Without any doubt. On the first task, there's no contest. It's that colleges and universities, number one, assist the student in developing to the limits of his or her potentialities. It's the second test, the second task, which is the test. And here's where we in student affairs must not lag. We must instead lead. And that is to do? That is that we must assist students in contributing to the development of society. Mm -hmm. And uh, lagging, we have done too much of. Leading, perhaps, not enough. As practitioners and teacher trainers in student affairs, where do we start on this goal then? Well, we start with a multifaceted community, which you know about. One of the reports recently released by the Carnegie Foundation on Advancement of Teaching has had a chilling effect on the country. Let me give you the title and let me give you just a short paragraph from uh, the page on which I read it on the, in the New York Times. It's called, The Fabric of Campus Life is in Tatters. And the lead paragraph reads, administrators, Teachers and students should develop a durable new compact that would restore two things, intellectual excitement and social cohesion to colleges, as well as to a model beyond the campus. What do you make of this call for a new compact? Uh, is it something to augment the 1937 SPPOV? I thought about it in those lines. We've really had two things since the 37 SPPOV. We've had a 1949 after World War II revision, and we've had this one of just three years ago that you've seen, Dr. Mashburn, titled A Perspective on Student Affairs. I think that the new compact would have to include something of the 49 and the 87, but I would guess that Beyond that, it would include ideas of teachers and researchers in a broad sweep of academic disciplines merged with student affairs. Mm -hmm. Then it would be a mending of fabric of yeah. the tattered yeah. piece uh, to be done in goodly company. And a very large and a very well-disciplined company. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's any single transforming quality that would be essential in producing social cohesion a model for campus life? Yes, and I thought about that a lot, even till the very last night, a lot, but let me go back a little further. I think there are visions of hope on the world scene for transformings multiple in nature. When President Havlock Hovel came to America in February and spoke to the U.S. Congress, he said something very important. I hope it was caught. He was exceedingly well received, by the way. Havel is himself a playwright. He knows good theater, and he knows the excitement therein. And he spoke of the transforming qualities that he saw in his country. Perhaps they exist in ours. And this is what he said. I will read it. It's very brief. Havel said, I speak in praise of the strength of young people who have never known any other political form than the one being overthrown. I find sources of inspiration for things, for truth, freedom of thought, political imagination, civil foresight. All of these coming to the fore in Czechoslovakia in a very short time. End of his quote. 
what he saw as a playwright in the young people of his country can certainly be found here. And I saw it last night on television in the words and the faces of the young people in New York City who were crowding the scene to hear Mandela. Mm -hmm. Is this then idea strictly European? Not at all. In the 1970s, UNESCO, and that's the United States Educational Scientific Cultural Organization, was busy over the nations, over the country. UNESCO convened a delegation in Manila, the Philippines, and I was the American uh, representative. What we studied was the strength of students in their government in East Asia. Now, in the convening, intervening time, all of us have been world watchers, and we have seen what students have done in China, Cambodia, in Korea, in Vietnam, and in the Philippines in their march toward social cohesion. Mm -hmm. You're credited with having served as major professor and advisor for 123 doctoral students in the period of time between 1966 and 1985. Do you recall any research conducted by those students dealing with fulfilling societal betterment or studying the possibilities for social cohesion? That meant, Dr. Meshborn, I had to look through a lot of dissertations, 123 of them, but I have found three, four, five, just in a quick look, and let me tell you about them. There was Dr. Will Connard's paper, and I'll read the words exactly so that I will not do an injustice to the title of his dissertation. It was, a study to determine, re-examine, is the word he used, the 1937 student personnel point of view in light of American social and educational change. And Will is an administrator in the American College for Applied Arts, and he moves in his office from London to Atlanta. Then I thought I found the paper of another graduate, and this is Dr. Tom Bowling. Bowling Wright wrote on the relationships between student activists and societal development, colon, a cross-cultural analysis. And Tom is an associate vice president for student affairs at Frostburg State College in Maryland. So much for the men. What about the women researchers that you taught? Well, they went at it a little differently. They studied, first of all, what the undergraduate student needed and wanted, that perspective, in education and in life in general. <coughs> Then the women study their own needs, professional needs, personal needs too, but largely professional, in order to deliver properly, to hook up with what students needed. Now, it was as if they were finding the goodness of fit between their adult model and the student in search of, the, of a model, man student, woman student as well. And to not let you go, Dr. Meshburn, I think I remember your topic for research centered on Florida A&M University here in Tallahassee, speaking to matters of uh, social cohesion, didn't it? Yes, it, I did. In fact, my conceptual framework had to do with pluralism, yeah. which states that no one model explains the universe. Therefore, Florida A&M University, as a model of higher education, has many contributions to make and have made many contributions. Right on. So it would seem from this very small sampling that I've given you in answer to your question, that the task, the task of contributing to the betterment of society, as it appeared in the 37 pronouncements, is capable of being researched by advanced students. I think we've nailed that one down. Would you go to the extreme of saying that all student affairs personnel are able to make this kind of contribution? I think the answer is one of degree, and I'm going to make a play on the word degree. As I phrased it in my remarks to the 1987 meeting of the American College Personnel Association and the National Association of Student Personnel Advisors, Administrators in Chicago, I said these words. I repeat, I pardon, but I think they're appropriate today. We have a diversity in our specialty unparalleled by other fields. We are the business-oriented and the management-prone. We're the keepers of records 
and with the keepers of law, with the technically trained, talented, and with the computer bitten. We are prophets and publicists and pundits in varying degrees, and our degrees are from anthropology, sociology, biology, psychology, criminology, and the technologies, the humanities, even music majors and creative writers. But to the uh, urgency of our time, the imperative is for us to become movers and shakers, showing our discontent with tattered fabric of our campuses and in mobilizing, enlisting, to use military terms, all on the campus community to transform it, to mend the tatters. You've been recently named as Professor Emerita upon recommendation of the faculty of the College of Education at Florida State University, in part for your 42 years of service to FSU, 1948 to 1990. Was not this monotonous at times? Oh, never really, never really. Because at FSU, there's a kind of continual, perpetual, meaningful motion, commotion sometimes too, that breaks the monotony. I think of five things that have occurred in my 42-year lifetime. First, there was the formulation of nine state universities. When I came here in 1948, there were only three. So you see this tripled. Then with that, Florida State University shunted off something and took on something. From a distinguished college for women, it became a state university. And that meant that we would integrate men's students in our new co-educational structure. And after that, something really big, following the civil rights legislation, there was integration of our black constituency. And more recently, and it's still going on, Florida State University has emerged as a research university with a dozen fields of acclaim. I would add another, which seems to summarize all of these before. In all of this, I've occupied a front seat viewing the scenario of the Southland, as I call it, with its cultural, economic, educational, political strides. Do those changes then in the South have any relation to the movement in the field of student personnel at the college level? Oh, college personnel in the South has had its own moving history. Forty years ago, on the boardwalks of Atlantic City, far from the Southland, there was born the Southern College Personnel Association. Now, we were considered by some, me considered it, an offshoot of the American College Personnel Association, kind of kissing cousins, so to speak, of the national membership. And for a number of years, we even held our grits and gravy breakfasts during the convention, honoring the ACPA standard bearers, let's say. Mm -hmm. And who were those standard bearers for the new Southern College Personnel Association? I can give you many. I'll give you several. Dr. Broward Culpepper, who was the Dean of Students at the Florida State University at the time of its co-educational shift, later became the Chancellor for the State University System. And he convinced Southern Regional Education Board in Atlanta, SREB, that its help in promoting our specialty was needed. And he had, as a co-helper, Dr. A.J. Brumbaugh, a professor of mine from the University of Chicago, also a consultant to SREB. And the two of them were trying to get across to us a message, they, along with Dr. Bill McLaughlin, of the board in Atlanta, that something was about to happen in the South for which we needed to be prepared. And this was the thought process they were leading us to. A question of great moment. This is what it was. Where in this country are the successful models of integration of black students in white colleges and universities? Probably at that time, there were no models. There were no models. You're quite right. 
but there were able and distinguished administrators staff and faculty in colleges and universities in the fourteen southern states and the district of columbia which was made our region there were those who were willing to connect with whatever was going to be started along the line of preparing for the integration of blacks there was dean max wise and dyke vermilia of the university of florida just down the road there was dr ben perry and dean sadie yancy and annie cooper of the florida a and m university many many others we'll call them faithful followers from the states that stretch from maryland to texas and in three summer conferences, 1951, 52, then we skipped one, 54, the so-called, we have the so-called movers and shakers variety, looked at the question again, which had to be answered. It hadn't been answered sufficiently then. How can we integrate students in our Southern institutions and can our product be marketable for the nation at large? Was it a quick and clear-cut decision, uh, this model construct? Not at all. In spite of summer conferences, in spite of interim state meetings, in spite of interim reports or programs, in spite of telephone calls and newsletters, because the Southern College Personnel Association was a fledgling organization, and it was learning to fly in what was sometimes a very lonely, perilous flight. I intend to write of this, this historic accomplishment, as time permits me this summer. But your former students, and I included, think you're putting your shoulders to the plow at High Noon Farms near Valdosta, Georgia. Well, you're absolutely right about the location. My farm is there. But my hands, they'll be on the keyboard of the typewriter. As you write the story of Brown v. Board, 1954, and the 40 years of student personnel work in the South, will, will you discuss the training programs for the student personnel major, masters, and doctoral? Yes, in fact, I don't think I can do without doing that, for there are differences among them, and we ought to be straightened out on some of those differences. You know one of them. I would guess uh, student personnel administration would be found increasingly in departments or programs of higher education. Yes, yes, yes. Increasingly is right. And therein, the prescribed coursework, because you're asking about the curriculum, would be what you experienced. You had finance and legal aspects, and you had curriculum and administrative theory and policy and planning and appropriate electives and quantitative and qualitative research and internships, and I'm about running out of breath on that. You then had all of it. Then a second mode then might be programs based in counseling and guidance, oh, yeah. health and human systems. And there's still a third. Mm -hmm. And this one, a little difficult to name it, but we can call it the You Make It Your Own Program name or an interdisciplinary program where a student wishes to do student personnel administration in higher education and signs for, let's say, communications and maybe political science and then policy studies and then interns in student affairs up in the office, which you know very well. We've looked then at student affairs, some of the beginnings and the present situation, the relationship with world events and affairs, mm -hmm. but what do you predict for the training programs in 1990 and beyond? Dr. Mashman, I would not dodge that question, not really, but I would remind you that seven years ago in 1983, Look here, we had the 25th anniversary of the program of higher education and student personnel is a part of that program. And a comparable question was asked and it was pondered. That's a word that my students taught me this year. It was pondered by 14 of you graduates who by that time had achieved administrative and teaching positions. You recall the occasion. Yes, I certainly do. This was a colloquium staged as theater, actually, in the round. Yes, it was. It was a luncheon meeting with speakers, some yes. in solo, some duo, yes. addressing topics of their choice. Well, I read <coughs> those contributions in this proceedings last night, 57 pages, large print, 
the one in which there was total agreement seven years ago, 1983, in this, this symposium, so to speak, call it what you will, the outstanding curriculum item was values education, that there be a prime ingredient, either inaugurated or continued, as far as 2008, call it what you will, ethics or moral development. I remember that one well. I also remember the fact that you had a musician there who wrote original scores there to go with our deliberations. Yes, that is exactly right. How did the music get in here? One wonders. Now in hot pursuit, in second place, the colloquium speakers in 83, seven years ago, said, well, the, cur the curriculum should certainly embrace policy analysis. That's how action derives public, private, combined on issues that are essential to the people. I think I might have guessed that one too. Well, guess on the third one. This was internationalizing of the curriculum, inclusion of world cultures rather than just Western culture. Well, ask yourself of these three, are they hot curriculum items now? They Have they cooled? They certainly appear to be at present. My only concern is a kind of three-way <coughs> stretch concern is that there not be uh, periods of tryouts that are too short for any addition to the curriculum. That there be time enough to test the goodness of what it is. And uh, I'm really recommending that changes in curriculum be in terms of a decade, a 10-year tryout. Seems long though, doesn't it? But the second point of my admonition is that it wouldn't be that we lock ourselves into an ever, ever, ever changing curriculum just to be modern or stylish rather than a never changing, which would be just as faulty. It's someplace in between there. Mm -hmm. Change, but time to test. And then the thought that I think I most want to leave is this, that I hope, whatever the subject under study, whatever, that student personnel professionals be continuing scholars because the title scholar is a prized descriptor. <laughs>